Father, we're grateful for this evening. We thank you for Scott and, and the work that he does with Burn Hickory. We pray for that church. Uh, Father, uh, uh, many of the people here uh, may not even know Scott. He's been gone a while, and a lot of the people here are newer than that. But uh, of the speakers here, with the exception of one, he's one I probably know best. And, and I know his heart, and I, I just pray that his heart comes through tonight as he uh, talks about this parable that your son told. Uh, we, we all understand what it's like to be a child. We all understand what it's like to be wayward. Uh, we've all sinned and fallen short of your glory, Father. And, and so as we get into the Word tonight and we look at this parable, our prayers that it touches our hearts and it, and it creates a, this, this uh, passion within us to serve you even more. And we thank you for Jesus. We know that without him we're hopeless, but with him we can do all things. And Father, our prayer is that we honor him by living on mission, by, by telling others his story, our story, and where those stories intersect. And Lord, we, we pray that whatever we do, in word and deed, that we lift up the name of Jesus so that men can be drawn to him. Allow that to happen today, and it's in his name we pray. And amen. Good evening, church. Well, as Joey said, it's been a while since we've been here, and uh, most of you probably don't know me, and I'm, I'm glad for that, because what that means is it just, it's another testament to how many new faces have come to this place in the time that we have left. And I love, I mean, the, the beautiful new facility. We were at the, the old Hickson, the beautiful new facility. Uh, just to see this church thrive is very, very satisfying to me. And I just, before I get the lesson, I just wanted to just share with you why this place is special to us. Uh, it was quite a while ago that we were here. Um, when we moved here, it was after a very hard time in our lives and marriage, after five months of unemployment for me, a uh, brand new baby. I got a job uh, here with a company called Kaplan. We're working at Chattanooga State. And this was the first time that my wife Sherry had ever lived away from Oklahoma. And so there was all sorts of, of stresses for us. And we found Hickson. And that very first Sunday night that we were here, I remember people were following us out into the parking lot to introduce themselves and to, to make us feel welcome. Uh, it was just extraordinary. And then I think it was that same Sunday night was the first Sunday night that Joel and Alicia Henderson invited us to their house for pizza. And I think we had pizza at their house every Sunday night for a year and a half. We had a, a, just a, a very neat group of people, a lot of us raising kids of the same age, that we really uh, cherished, and, and we still do. We really appreciate uh, what you all meant to, to us and our little family for that period of time. I mentioned that baby, and it seems like the, the, those of you who I have seen since then, you always ask about the baby that we brought with us, Darby. And so I have a, a, a picture of that baby. Now, if we have the slide for that. Maybe not. There she is. That's what she looked like when we were here. That's what she looks like now. Tomorrow, I'm taking that baby to college for her first, her first year of college at Oklahoma Christian. So we leave tomorrow morning to take Darby uh, to school. I'm really sorry that Sherry and, and Darby and, and uh, Roxy, our younger one who you don't, don't know, couldn't be here. We just, they just couldn't make it work with, with Sherry's job and Darby getting packed. And so I'm, I'm very sorry that they could not be here uh, tonight as well. The prodigal son. I really like what Joey has, has done with this story. Let's go ahead and, and flip over to the, the next slide. I, this, is, this is the most famous probably of all of Jesus's parables and for good reason. In most parables, um, really the, the best way to interpret a parable is you look for there's, there's one main point. Usually there's, there's one character that we are supposed to relate to, one character that we're supposed to put ourselves in their shoes. Oftentimes it's a servant. And there's one point that Jesus is trying to make with that story. And usually it's, 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 it's a little bit dangerous to try to read too much else into a parable. But this parable, this parable does serve from several different facets. This parable is something you can build an entire series around. And I think that with this particular parable, we can relate, at least some of us can relate, to every character in this parable. If you're, if you're a parent, you can relate to the father. You know what it's like when your kid breaks your heart. 
You know how you worry at home about what your son is doing when he's away. And everyone who's been in the church very long, maybe grew up in the church like I did, we can relate to the older brother and the warning in that older brother's attitude, that intolerance that he shows, that the sense of superiority, the way he can, he can start to resent the father even as he continues to obey dutifully and serve the father. I think some of us who have been in church long enough, we, we can relate to maybe that and to him too. So some of us can relate to the father, some of us can relate to the older son. All of us should be able to relate to the prodigal. If there's any one character in this story that all of us are meant to relate to, it's the prodigal. Because he is every one of us. As I'm going to show you, his story is your story. His story is my story. I am the prodigal. And so are you. This is our story. Let's flip over to that first passage. Let's, let's read the, the story. It's in Luke 15, starting in verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. I've really, I've really tried to put myself in, in, in his spot and tried to come up with how, how do you rationalize this? What do you tell yourself when you do this? When you, when you go to your father and say this. The basic way of saying is, I, I want what would come to me when you die, the inheritance. But I don't want to wait for you to die. So give it to me now. In essence, what he's saying is, I wish you were already dead, Dad. I wish you were already dead. It's an act of monstrous selfishness. And I don't know how this son could have justified it unless he, he somehow told himself something about the father. The only way you can do something like this is you've got to somehow make it his fault. So I don't know what he said. I don't know what he, what he did. Maybe he decided if, if he didn't act now, the, the father's not trustworthy. What if, what if after dad is dead, my older brother, you know how he is. What if, what if that will is read? What if I, I've been cut out? I, I want to get it now while I still have some control. More likely, I think what he decided was the father was too demanding, too restrictive, and he shouldn't live under that sort of confinement any longer. It's not fair. And even then, it's hard to find sympathy with this son. I know that. And you may be thinking, well, you say this is all of our story. That's not my story, Scott. I would never do something like that. I've never done anything like that to anyone. And there's certainly never been any wild living for me. I don't know about your wild living, but I still believe what this is describing is what every sin looks like from the perspective of God. See, I think part of our problem with relating to this story is this is from the perspective of God. This is how it looks and feels to God. We want to put our sins on some sort of sliding scale that places us a safe distance from the really bad people. And then we're, we're okay. We're not perfect, but we're not them. But this, what the younger son does, this is what every sin feels like to the holy God. This is what it looks like, every sin from his perspective, every sin, from the very first one. Let's flip over to the next slide. Adam and Eve, I want you to think about what Adam and Eve did. They were given a perfect home by God, provided everything they could ever need in a beautiful setting with just one restriction. There's just that one. In all the force, there's just that one 
tree that is forbidden. For your own good. It's for your own good, but that one tree is forbidden in all of the garden. And yet the serpent convinces them to see that one tree in a different light. It ceases to be, look at everything God has given us, and the focus becomes, why would he hold that back from us? What's he keeping from us? What does he not want us to know? And the serpent convinces them, this must be because your father is not trustworthy. Why would he keep something that looks so good from you? Why place this in the garden and tell you it's dangerous and not even put a fence around it? What sort of good parent would do that? You need to take matters into your own hands. You need to go out on your own and experience for yourself whatever he's holding back. You need to decide for yourself if it's good or if it's bad. What they were saying in essence when they took that forbidden fruit was, God, we'll gladly accept all the good stuff you provide, but we don't really need you. We'd like the blessings, but independent of you. Does that sound familiar? It's Luke 15. That's exactly what the prodigal son said. It's the same pride and selfishness that's behind that first sin and every sin. Every sin is that sort of insult to the holy and perfect love of God. That's what it looks like from his viewpoint. That's how much a holy God must forgive. How far he must reach down to extend us mercy. Give us the next slide, please. It's Proverbs 20, verse 21. If you insult your father or mother, your light will be snuffed out in total darkness. An inheritance obtained too early in life is not a blessing in the end. See, this story and the prodigal, it's all over in your Bible. Just like that proverb predicts, things do not turn out well for this son who took his inheritance too early. Next slide, Luke 15, starting in verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Now notice it said, he hired himself out, but he got nothing. Never got paid. He, he wasn't even given the pig fodder. He's starving. Now, who is this citizen of the country that would do that? Who would do that to someone? Hire him and pay him nothing. Starve him. Let's think about this. The son left his father, and we know the father represents God. If you leave God, whose country are you in? If you leave God's home, where do you go? Whose country are you in? I'm convinced this citizen of the country is Satan. He's the fourth character in this story. Satan is the father of lies, just, just the sort that would offer to hire you and then not pay you. He has nothing to offer you. There's nothing to gain from him. What are the wages of sin? Death. You hire yourself out to Satan, what's he gonna pay you? Death. There's nothing else. That's always where it goes. The reality, according to the scripture, is that if you leave God the Father, like Adam and Eve and the prodigal son attempted to do, you are in the realm of wickedness. You belong to Satan. Now, I know the world tends to scoff at that. I know that most people outside these walls would find that ridiculous. Because we've convinced ourselves that we don't need God, but that doesn't make us evil. We, we, can, we, can, we can create this place, we can be in this, in this place that is, is 
secular and, and rational and, and neatly ordered in between God and evil. We don't need God, but we're certainly not evil. But Scripture says no such place exists. There is no option C. You are with God or you're with Satan. You will have a master. And as much as we chafe at that idea, the Scripture is very consistent on that. Let's look at the next slide. It's Romans 6, 16. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. The Bible says that is the binary reality. You will belong to someone, you will serve someone, and your choices are either God the Father or sin. And if you don't choose God, your other choice always leads to death. So back to the prodigal. He discovers this truth for himself, and now he is empty. Now he is starving. He no longer has to obey the Father. He's got the independence he was looking for, but does that make him free? No. He doesn't find freedom. He finds exactly what the book of Romans predicts. In Romans 6, next slide, 20 and 21. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. He's free from the Father, but now a slave, reaping nothing but what brings him shame. As you, as you probably know, in, in, in this time and place, for a Jewish man, hogs were ceremonially unclean animals. The Mosaic Law told them to avoid certain animals, including hogs, as just, it was just a, a, a sign. It was, it was a way to symbolize that they were set apart for God. The prodigal son spent all day in a condition that brought him constant shame. All day long, he is unclean. What sin, or when sin, is your master? Just like this son, you end up doing things that would have been unimaginable to you before. It would have been unimaginable when he was the son of his father to wind up swapping pigs and wanting to eat what they were eating, to be in their filth literally every day, starving, unthinkable. But when sin's your master, you wind up in places that at one point would have been unthinkable for you. And some of you know that firsthand. Some of you have an addict in your family. Maybe you are an addict. Maybe you are in recovery. You know how those people, spurred by their desires, can end up stealing cash from their parents or selling their bodies to pay for another fix. Or you descend into the world of pornography until you are letting people into your home through a screen that you would never allow in the front door. Or you told a lie that required another lie to cover that lie, and now you're in so deep you don't even recognize yourself. And always the regret, and always shame. Next slide, Luke 15, let's go back to the story. When he came to his senses, when he looked around and realized, I am in a place that is inconceivable to me not so long ago, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. He came to his senses. That's good. But notice how he plans on approaching the father. Don't treat me like a son. Hire me as a servant. That sounds humble, 
I guess, at first, but, but listen to that. What's he trying to do? The prodigal is still trying to make things happen on his terms. He isn't going home because he misses his father. He's not going home because he wants to be with his father. He's going home because that's the surest way to a paycheck. He's going to dig himself out of this hole, himself out of this hole. He's going to earn his way back into the black. He is doing his best still to be independent and in control. Next slide. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. What's this? This has to be the last thing the prodigal expected, which is really sad. Which is really sad. Because it means he still doesn't know his father. He still doesn't appreciate the father he has. So he starts the speech. He's been, he's been running the speech through his head the, the whole way home. He's been rehearsing this. He's outlining the terms of the deal. Okay, Dad, I did wrong. I'm sorry. Here's what i like you to do for me. Next slide. And the son said to him, as we start the speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And... But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The prodigal doesn't even get to finish his little speech. His father cuts him off before he can say, I'm not your son, just hire me as a servant. I'm not your son. Here's the terms of, of how I'd like to continue on with you. He never gets those words out. You know why? Because they are useless. The fathers want to hear that. When we realize that we don't want to live in sin any longer, when we repent from that and turn to God, we don't set the terms. The father sets him straight. Son, you were not just away. You were dead. We don't grasp how bad our sin is. But we're dead in our sins. And dead people don't negotiate. Dead people don't set the terms. We don't grasp how bad our sin is, but we also don't grasp how much our Father loves us. The prodigal pictured himself as a servant but he's immediately embraced as a son. That's our story. That's your story. That's my life story. And it is told over and over in Scripture. Listen to how it's told here in Ephesians 2. Next slide, please. As for you, this is Paul writing, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. Back when the prodigal lived in shame, deceived and away from the father. Next slide. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following his desires and thoughts. Like the rest... We were by nature deserving of wrath. All of us. Paul is writing this letter to Christians. He's writing this letter to people just like us sitting in a church. The good religious people. But he still includes all of them. Because this is the story of every one of us. We have all rebelled against the Father in some way, and by rights, we deserve his wrath. When we walk down that road, when we turn to him, we rightly should brace for his wrath. That's what we deserve. But, next slide. But because of his great love for us, because of the Father that we have, God, who is rich in mercy, 
made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We were lifted up just like that prodigal. We were lifted up and along with his son, Christ, our father made us co-heirs. Co-heirs with Christ. Treated us not as servants, but children of God. We don't realize, I don't think we can fully comprehend how bad our sin is from the viewpoint of a holy God. Nor do we grasp that what God wants to give us is so much more and better than what we can imagine. The prodigal had no picture of anything like this. Next slide. In order that, this is why the Father does this for us. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You don't come and negotiate terms with God. You don't earn what he wants to give you, because you will never be good enough. You will never do enough good. It's a gift. And there is a profound truth. And there is the sticking point for so many people. What the prodigal had to get past was his own pride. What so many of us need to get past is our own pride. It is pride that keeps most people from ever returning to the Father. We want his blessings. We want a good life. We want the good things. But without being required to obey him without any investment from us, without any responsibility to him. We want to feel good about ourselves, but without facing the Father to admit we can't be good without him. Next slide. Pride is what makes us prodigals. And until we find the humility to admit that what we need is something we cannot earn, we will never find our way home. That's our lesson for tonight. I just want you to hear how much your Father loves you. Let's pray to him now. Father in heaven, we thank you we can come like this before you. We are told that we can enter into your throne room. We can do so confidently because and only because of your grace and mercy, the sacrifice of your son. And Lord, we acknowledge we can't comprehend the wonders of your love. But we can't acknowledge our own pride. And I ask a prayer tonight for everyone here, for those that we have left at home today, for everyone who is still struggling with that, still struggling with that desire for independence, that desire to figure out on our own, that desire to earn our way to goodness. I pray for them. I pray, Lord, that you speak to them. I pray that they come to grasp what they have to lay at your feet More than anything, what they come to grasp is how welcoming you are, how much you love us, how far your grace and mercy and forgiveness extends. We know, Lord, that Jesus came for all sinners and for all sins. And I ask that if anyone here still struggles with accepting that that forgiveness reaches even them, I ask, Lord, you break through that wall. I ask that they lay aside that pride. They lay aside that mistrust in your goodness and your heart. And they come home. 
We pray for them tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.